Hi everyone, welcome back to our weekly Q&A at College Vine. I'm Katie and every week I spend some time answering questions that you've submitted via YouTube and our website in order to help you get a better understanding of a wide variety of admissions topics. Don't forget that if you're applying to college soon, you can visit us online at app.collegevine.com to sign up for a free account. You'll get a bunch of guided resources, including calculating your chances of getting into specific schools, free profile recommendations, essay guidance, and a whole lot more. Check out that website, app.collegevine.com to learn more. And also don't forget that if you'd like to submit a question for us to answer in a future Q&A, you can leave that question in the comments below this video. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're one of the first to see when we drop our latest Q&A or any other type of helpful admissions video. Let's get started with the four questions for today. The first one comes from Darius, who wanted to know which month is best to take an ACT or an SAT test. This is a great question. And it's one that we can actually look at from a few different angles. So sometimes when we hear this question about timing for standardized tests, we get it from students who are concerned about scoring curves. Other students want to know which month is known for having the easiest test because they want to do the best. Well, the truth is that these exams are equally difficult at all times of the year. Neither the ACT nor the College Board curves test based on student performance. So there's no greater benefit associated with taking the test in January than in, say, September. Instead of curving the SAT or ACT based on how well students perform, the College Board and the ACT both use an equating process in assigning scores. In other words, test makers recognize that not all versions of these tests are equally difficult. Some tests, of course, just happen to be harder or easier for students. So the College Board and the ACT adjust raw scores to accommodate for minor differences in test difficulty across various months. The idea is that earning a 1600 or a 36 on the ACT should mean the same thing whether you took that test in January 2018 or in June 2019. That statistical process ensures that scores are fair and accurate at least as much as possible for everyone who takes these exams. So now that we've got that part of the question out of the way, how do you choose the right month for you personally to take the SAT or the ACT? There are a few factors that you ought to consider. The most important considerations are the admissions deadlines at the colleges on your application list. After all, you do not want to risk turning in your scores too late to be considered for admission. Most schools have regular decision deadlines in December and January. That means that the very last test date possible to submit scores on time would be November and December, respectively. Students who want to apply early decision or early action, usually with November deadlines, need to take the test by October of their senior year at the latest. Of course, this can vary by school, so be sure to check on the deadlines of each of the schools on your list. You should also consider scholarship deadlines when signing up to take the exam. For example, some colleges automatically consider you for merit scholarships if you submit a complete application that includes those test scores by an earlier date than the regular decision deadline. For instance, at Purdue University, that deadline was November 1st this past year. In this case, you would have wanted to have received your scores by October. For those eligible for the National Merit Scholarship, you also need to submit your SAT scores by fall of senior year, typically October, which means that you need to take the test in advance of that month. Finally, you need to make sure you've taken all the necessary courses prior to scheduling the test. For example, students should wait to take the SAT until they've completed both Geometry and Algebra 2, as the concepts in both of those classes are tested extensively on the exam. For our ideal calendar of SAT and ACT testing, you might want to check out our post, Not Sure When to Take the SAT, ACT, Here's Your Guide which we'll link in the comments below this video. Thanks for writing in Darius and good luck on taking either the SAT or the ACT, maybe both. Next up today, we have Sunny who wrote in to ask us, do extracurriculars that are not related to my main academic goal, which is math, so an extracurricular like rifle shooting, for example, do those non-related extracurriculars help with college admissions? Well, as always, thank you for writing in and we're glad to hear that you're thinking ahead to your overall holistic profile as a college applicant. Of course, every college considers extracurriculars a bit differently, but there are a few general factors that help to determine how heavily your various extracurricular activities will be weighed in the admissions process. First of all, of course, extracurriculars that are directly related to your academic interests certainly help to build your profile as a specialized applicant. If you are a specialized applicant in the field of mathematics, for instance, that generally means that you're interested in math, you excel at math, and you pursue math successfully outside of the academic classroom. Still, colleges don't look only for specialized candidates. They also want well-rounded members of their college community that will contribute various skills and interests to make campus life diverse and vibrant. One way that they weigh the value of your various extracurriculars in that kind of holistic sense is through a weighted tier system that considers how successful and how heavily involved you've been in each activity on your list. 
This helps to lend insight into not only your skills in these discrete areas, but also the soft skills associated with them, such as commitment, leadership, and initiative in each activity. So here's a breakdown of how the tier system generally works in weighing extracurriculars. Tier one activities are the best. They're the most impressive to college admissions officers, but that's because they're fairly rare. They represent exceptional accomplishments or leadership, and these activities make a strong impression on admissions officers because they aren't seen very frequently in the applicant pool. Tier one extracurriculars, for example, are winning a role in a major motion picture or becoming a nationally ranked athlete. If you are a highly ranked rifleman on the national circuit, that could certainly qualify as a tier one activity. However, keep in mind that the average applicant is unlikely to participate in many or any tier one activities most will participate in none. The second most impressive tier of extracurriculars are tier two extracurriculars. To qualify for tier two, an activity must allow students to showcase their leadership. Examples include chairing a committee for the National Honor Society or serving as the editor in chief of the student newspaper. For instance, if you're the president of your local rifle shooting club, that would be a good example of a tier two type activity. If you aren't a club leader, you can still earn tier three status if you receive other recognition or awards in a given activity. For instance, perhaps you've won local or statewide rifle shooting competitions. If so, that would be a tier three extracurricular activity on your profile. Finally, tier four activities are the most common and tend to make a less significant impression on college admissions officers as they evaluate your profile. These are things like participating in debate or playing JV soccer. Those are tier four activities. And although they aren't as prestigious as those in tier one, two, or three, they can still provide colleges with valuable information about who you are as a person. If you participate consistently in rifle shooting but haven't won awards or earned any leadership positions, that would be a tier four activity. So in sum, while it's great to have activities that are linked directly to your academic interests, such as math, other extracurriculars are still valued on your application, and the extent to which they are valued will depend on how deeply involved and successful you've been within that activity. I hope that answers your question, Sunny, and best of luck crafting that extracurricular profile for your college applications. Our third question today came from Santana, who wrote in to ask, what kind of extracurricular activities should I pursue if I am applying to study environmental studies? A great question. Environmental studies are an increasingly popular choice for students interested in the sciences. Environmental studies is a field with really solid career growth. That means a lot of jobs, and the jobs in this field tend to offer pretty good pay and income. If you're interested in pursuing environmental studies, it is wise to start building a focused extracurricular profile toward that field now while you're still in high school. Here are some ideas to get you started with those extracurriculars. Number one is volunteer for a local nonprofit. Including service in your extracurricular profile is really always a good idea for college applications, and meshing service with an area of your interest makes even more sense. And there's more good news. Environmental science tends to be an area where there are many nonprofits, many volunteer opportunities, both in your local community and nationally or internationally. Volunteering will allow you to learn about the nonprofit world, which once again is really integral to many environmental science efforts. You'll also gain exposure to the day-to-day -day activities of these organizations, which depends on the organization, but might include research, publications, public outreach, advocacy, and much more. You might get started by looking for established volunteer opportunities. These could include things like recycling programs, conservation projects, habitat restoration work, or sustainable living education. You can network through friends, family, and teachers at your school to get an idea of what types of organizations already exist in your area. If you're not finding anything that suits your interests or works for your schedule and logistics, you can always start your own volunteer project as a personal mission or with a group of interested peers or classmates. Taking initiative to start your own project is viewed as especially ambitious by admissions committees. Talk to a teacher or mentor to decide if starting your own project is a good option for you. Finally, don't forget that your volunteer work could provide important networking for future internships, job opportunities, or mentorship. Be sure to keep in touch with your volunteer supervisor even after you've finished your project and let him or her know if you're ever available for other opportunities. That connection with that person could become an important one further down the line, even while you're in college and after you're in college seeking a career in environmental sciences. A second idea for your extracurriculars is to conduct a research project. An independent research project is a great option for the future environmental scientist who is seriously considering a career in research. To get started, think of the local issues or concerns that interest you the most. Try to find something that you truly care about or that's really locally relevant in your community. Oftentimes that makes the work much research, much more meaningful. I also try to find a mentor who can help to guide you throughout your research. This could be a teacher at your school, or it could be someone else who has some level of expertise in the field 
and maybe has worked with you closely in some academic capacity in the past. To learn more about conducting an independent research project, you might want to check out the College Mind blog post, A Guide to Pursuing Research Projects in High School. We've gone ahead and linked that in the comments below for your convenience. A third idea for your environmentally related extracurriculars is to conduct your own public outreach campaign. Another way to show that you care about the environment while also caring about affecting change in your community is by conducting a public outreach campaign focused on an area of personal interest or local relevance. While it's certainly possible that you could run an outreach campaign on your own, you could start your own project, get it going, you'll be more effective and generally achieve a broader reach if you start a school club or a community program that allows you to work as part of a team. It will allow you to amplify that impact in your community. Starting your own outreach campaign demonstrates great leadership skills and initiative to college admissions officers. In addition, you'll ideally have the satisfaction of seeing the impact that your program has on your community. Some common ideas for public outreach campaigns could include things like meatless Mondays, recycling or repurposing programs, or important habitat conservation in your local community. Really, your best bet, though, is to think about the issues that really concern you on a local level. That local level could mean your school, your small hometown, your state, and start there. A fourth idea is to enroll in a summer program or in college classes. If you have time to pursue your extracurriculars during the summer months, you'll find that you have even more opportunities available to you. Many programs offer summer environmental classes that often come with extensive lab time and even hands-on field work. Here are a few options to consider. We're going to put links to these programs in the comments below so that you can access them easily and do some research on your own. One is Sustainable Summer. It offers travel and adventure learning trips geared specifically toward environmental science. Their courses range from ecology, conservation, and agriculture to policy, sustainable design, and sustainable energy. Courses take place in a number of locales around the world, including India, Ecuador, the Galapagos, but their Environmental Leadership Academy is offered only at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. The National Student Leadership Conference also offers an environmental science and sustainability program, so it's another one to look into. In that program, students work with top research scientists and policy advocates to explore pressing environmental issues and then the career paths that address those issues. These classes take place at either Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, or the University of Colorado. Brown University also offers high school students the chance to, quote, study the interactions between natural and social systems with Brown affiliated educators and place based experts, end quote. Those courses also include leadership development with the mission of developing socially responsible leaders of tomorrow. Brown Environmental Leadership Lab, or BELL, is offered both in Alaska and at Brown's campus along the Rhode Island coast. Another strong option for a summer extracurricular program is the Stanford School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Science. In this program, high school students work in actual research laboratories on existing projects supervised by Stanford's graduate students. Different areas of focus and varying time commitments are available as options. At this time, only high school students who go to school in the San Francisco Bay Area are eligible, however. Keep in mind that if you do wind up pursuing one of these opportunities, it will be most meaningful on your college application, only if you do so as part of a larger context in your profile. That is to say, participating in one summer program for a limited period of time, particularly if the program is located in a more remote part of the world, does little to contextualize your interest in environmental science as a serious and prolonged passion and pursuit for a lifetime. So we hope that some of these ideas inspire your pursuit of environmental studies, Santana. And thanks as always for writing in with that question. Our fourth and final question today came from Maddie, who wrote in to say, people always say to find that one thing that sets your application apart from everyone else's, that one thing that makes you truly unique. Well, she asks, how do you find that perfect thing, that one thing that makes you unique? This is a great question, and I suspect that it's probably one that's really in the mind of many of our viewers now. Essentially, high school students are tasked with a really difficult thing when applying to selective colleges finding what makes them unique and weaving that thread throughout the college application. It's much easier said than done and it causes a lot of stress for a lot of students. Here at College Vine, we often refer to this one thread, this one unique thing as your admissions theme. The admissions theme is not just what makes your application stand out from others. It's also really the narrative that brings together the different aspects of your academic, your personal, your extracurricular lives. And it lends context to really everything you've been up to in high school and also how you express it via essays and recommendation letters. A strong admissions theme will leave an admissions officer and a broader admissions committee, feeling as though they have some understanding of who you are, not just as a student at a high school, but also as a person and a member of your local community. They should have a sense of what motivates you or has led you down your current path and how those factors impact your vision and goals for the future in college and beyond. 
Crafting this narrative is not an easy thing, but with a little planning and some expert insight, you'll be on the right track in really no time. Choosing a theme for your application isn't easy, but once again, without one, it's difficult to tell your story in a way that's coherent and powerful. So it's very important to spend the time in this area. While many students do just make their academic major or future career goals the focus of their application, you can still choose a theme if you're applying to college undecided. Your goal is just to provide admissions departments with a framework that helps them understand the personal details you're sharing. That doesn't have to be in the context of a particular major or career field. For ideas of themes separate of those majors or career fields, here are a few ideas that might spur some brainstorming. One theme idea is relationships. This theme showcases your fascination with how relationships work and the ways in which people influence one another in all of our shared lives. For example, you might share how your experience coaching youth soccer led you to develop a passion for teaching and affected your interactions with your own soccer teammates on your own team. It could have inspired you to do more volunteer work in local elementary schools, start your own tutoring business, or ultimately pursue teaching as a career. Another theme could be family. This theme focuses on how families keep people together despite often having differences and struggles. An application with the theme of family might include an essay on your relationship with a beloved grandparent and how that relationship inspired you to do or change something either in your home or community. It might explain why you've developed specific academic interests. It might explain how your family has inspired you to pursue academic interests both inside and outside of the classroom. Another admissions theme is effort. Sometimes hard work can be its own reward. An application theme centered on effort might include your experience working toward an upward grade trend after you did some stumbling early in your high school career. You can draw connections between that experience and your experience on the athletic field or in your summer job or in any other different context. What did you learn from those struggles and how will those experiences impact who you plan to become as a college student and a successful young adult? Another theme is leadership. Many colleges are passionate about identifying and recruiting students who are leaders in their schools and communities. An application focused on leadership might showcase a student's passion for social justice, how you developed a project to serve underprivileged folks in your community, or how the leadership skills that you learned have been applied in other contexts beyond just the context in which you learned them. Once you identify your admissions theme, you need to make sure that it resonates throughout your application, including the classes you took, the activities you pursued, the essays you wrote. You want to make sure it shines clearly through your full academic extracurricular essay letter of recommendation profile. A strong theme does far more than provide the admissions committee with information about your scholastic and extracurricular accomplishments. Once again, it provides context for them and gives insight into forming a holistic profile of you as a person. By incorporating that theme throughout your entire application, you can impress the admissions committee with a comprehensive glimpse into what makes you tick as an applicant, as a student, as a person, and hopefully as a future member of their college community. Thanks again for writing in that question, Maddie. So thank you to the four of you who submitted this week's questions, and hopefully those answers were helpful not only to those four of you, but the broader audience of our College Vine YouTube channel. If you have a question that you want answered, remember to submit your question for the next video in the comments below this video. In the meantime, we'll see you soon for our next Q&A. Thank you.